Well, let's take our Bibles. Let's turn to Ephesians 5, please. Ephesians chapter 5. And in typical fashion, we're going to just go through one verse today. <clears throat> but I'll go ahead and preface it with this. We have to, because everything that flows through the rest of this section about what God is prescribing for believers to do is centered in on this one word. And this one word stands in, in this verse as a hinge between what came before it and what is going to come after it. And so... Uh, I think that being said, and, and knowing the subject matter at hand, we definitely need to take a moment and pray, so let's do so. Father, we thank you for your word, and we know, Father, that your word apart from the Holy Spirit is nothing, uh, that not only is he the author of the text, divinely inspiring, but also, Father, that he is the illuminator of the person who reads it. And so we pray, Lord, please, sins confessed, remembering upon the body and blood of the Lord Jesus, looking forward and anticipating His return. We ask, Father, please, for mercy and insight and understanding and a, and a divine work done upon our hearts as only You can do it through Your Word today. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's lay some groundwork real quick. Ephesians is divided up into two sections. Six chapters, but it's very easy to divide it up into C. If you just flow along with the thought of it, take some mental notes as you go along, you'll, you'll come to some conclusions. And you find out that in chapters 1, 2, and 3, it is all about teaching. What we need to know about what God has done for us in Christ. The amazing thing about that is, is that Paul doesn't ask us to do anything in the first three chapters. It's just all stuff he wants you to know. But he wants you to know for good reason. And that's because God has called us to a brand new life to live. And this is what the last three chapters have to deal with. The idea of how we exercise this glorious practice in our life, where we are now about this prescription, because you are in Jesus and because all of chapters 1, 2, and 3 are true about you, here's how living should be different. That's really, really important. Because it gives you a basis, a foundation of which to walk upon so that you're not out there saying, well, maybe this works. Well, maybe this works. And here's another interesting thing is it will actually save me from my best intentions towards people. Now, that might not sound like much. But you go about this long enough and you find out that even your best intentions are sin, regardless of how well-meaning they are. That's reflective of just how depraved we are, how much the sin nature likes to have control over us. But it also makes us recognize that if it is not Christ in us doing it, then it's not pleasing to God and it's not God's work. You say, well, that sounds like a really, I don't know, fine line there. It is. It is. And that's exactly why these last chapters were written in light of the riches that we have in order to show us that a worthy walk is allowing Christ to walk, not us. It is coming to the resolve that we will stop living our lives so that Christ will live his life through us. And the problem is, is we love our lives and we love ourselves. That is the great dichotomy here. So, with that being said, what are your goals? You ever gone through and thought about what you really want out of life? Maybe you've got your bulletin, you pen write it down maybe you got a mental note you know what your goals are you know what you want to accomplish and let's be honest the key word here is not really goals it's your why is that because it's usually all about me i thought this was interesting the lord is doing an incredible work in my life and i want to share it with you and i don't understand it and i'm still not really accepting of it right now for the past three or four days, every sip of coffee I have taken has been terrible. <laughs> you laugh. This is tragic, okay? <laughs> I don't even know what to do with myself, okay? I really don't. Where's Jim Riker? Where you at? He brewed coffee twice for me today. I said, try it at this strength. Okay, he did it for me. 
I said, now let's try it at this strength, okay? He did it for me. I'm like, it all tastes terrible. What's going on? It was my own coffee. I bought it at Cracker Barrel. I like Cracker Barrel's coffee. It's all right, you know. But yeah, yeah, I used to. But then I found myself before Sunday school, oh my gosh, I'm having tea. I know. I'm becoming like Zach, man. What is going on? I don't know. So, what are your goals? What do you strive for in life? What do you hope to see happen? I thought this was interesting because I was actually brewing tea the other day at home, dealing with this traumatic turn of events in my life. Here are the tea bags. The purpose of life is to know yourself, love yourself, with, withhold all noises, please. Jay's enough. I don't need the rest of you getting in on this, okay? The purpose of life is to know yourself, love yourself, trust yourself, and be yourself. What does the Lord say? The heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? This is where world goals are. You, 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 you. And what's amazing is, is if you want to know where the church gets it wrong, it's not that they've got to have a strange translation of the Bible. It's not that they've got to have nothing but well-meaning programs to help people. It's not any of that stuff. It's simply the fact that it needs to become about self in the slightest in order for it to all go wrong. Jesus already loves you perfectly, and you can't love yourself more than Him, so stop trying. Because loving ourselves is usually an excuse to allow sin to have its say. And we have to be very much aware of that. To recap real quick, so we're not going to read all of the things in this section about the prescription, but what are the old man ways? What is the self-man or self-life ways, how we live before Christ. There they are. There they are. And there they are. All of these are what it looks like for us to work without God. In fact, what we're, what we're often likened to, if you were to read through some of the, the other writings of Paul and you would see Romans chapter 5, he likens this to the idea of Adam. The, the, the man independent of himself apart from God. The first Adam that was put forward. And it's all flesh. It's all, it's all best intentions or it's all most heinous sins, to, to, regardless of what they are. They all fall in a category of Christlessness. And so therefore, that's why they're dangerous. So Paul has been warning us through this time, you don't have to live like that anymore. This is how pagans act. Now, pagan isn't a dirty word. It's somebody who lives godlessly. That's what it means. This is how pagans live. You don't have to live like that. Christ liberated you from the old man and now has set you free. And what he will tell us is, is take off that old shirt, cast it to the side, get your mind renewed with the word of God. Know what it says. And when you apply it in your life, you're actually putting on this brand new shirt that Christ died to give you. Now, what do we have in the new man ways? Or what is the Christ life? look like well here's what we find what beautiful things you can actually have your mind renewed you ever dealt with somebody and they're like you know what i don't care what the bible says and you think oh, how dare you and i'm like they don't know jesus what were you expecting them to say but isn't it an amazing paradigm shift to say i can actually read god's word and actually know it and know that god is actually working with me to implement it in my life that could have never happened before christ could have never happened do you realize that you can be righteous and holy in the truth like i don't feel righteous and holy you don't have to you already are in christ you can handle anger properly right praise the lord you can have edifying speech verbal grace givers good grief this is good stuff i, I want to hang out with these people right you can be light in the lord you can be pleasing to God. You can actually expose dark deeds and they're not a problem. I don't know if you've noticed it's happening today on the world scale. Even pagans are recognizing that other pagans are doing wrong things. I love it. You know what that tells me? It tells me that God has done something intrinsic in the heart to give us a baloney meter. 
That's baloney. That's not, right? Say no. Using our time wisely, we can actually do that. We can actually be filled with this Spirit. That's amazing. He actually wants to empower us and lead us to do things in areas that we could never do before. You guys should have seen the last speech I gave in speech class. Sophomore year, it was horrible. I hated talking in front of people. I had to memorize a monologue for something. You know, like that. Then I end up marrying a theater person. So anyway. Uh, these are from the holy view of life. All of these are all qualities that if we had to put them all together in a blender and hit blend, Christ would come out of it. It is all reflective of the life that He lives. This is a great quote. I believe the practical difficulty with us all is to say, not Adam in any form or quality, the old man. No. It's us saying no to self. But Christ liveth in me. Every believer likes to advance himself spiritually, but hardly anyone likes to exchange himself for another man. Let that sink in for a second, because I can tell that none of you went, mm, you didn't get it, okay? So let me read it to you again. Every believer, saved person, likes to advance himself spiritually. Don't we like that? Don't we like to feel like I'm spiritually growing and I'm going to get involved in this Bible study and I'm going to grab this book and ooh, I got to get that. And, oh, somebody brought that up and oh, I got to get a hold of that now. And, uh, and it's like we're totally without any sort of contentment whatsoever because the desire is to fuel self even in a spiritual means. And what this man is hitting on the head is, no, it's not about that. If you really want to grow spiritually, the idea is crucify yourself, give you up, and exchange yourself for another man. For who? Christ. Lay myself down so that Christ can rise up in me. The key to spiritual growth is I must decrease so that he can increase. John the Baptist had it right. He recognized it. It is recognizing that the flesh profits nothing. Only the things that are of spirit and truth are of any worth toward God. Here we go. Chapter 5, verse 18. And the reason why we're, we're, we're backing up on this is because we need to focus in on the main verb that is given here because everything flows out from this main verb. And we're going to see how it's going to transition into it next week. Do not get drunk with wine. And remember, the subject here is about what is controlling you. For that is dissipation. But be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing, making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things in the name of of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father. Stop there. Because verse 21 is where we're going to hit it. But first we need to see this. What are the participles of this main verb to be filled? Number one, we're to be speaking to one another. Notice it's verbalized. And notice the content of our speech is a harmonious one. It's not critical, it's not crass, it's not crude, it's not tearing down, it's everything to build up. And everything that properly builds up in the Spirit is only derived from one source, and that is the Word of God. So it's the idea of having that so tethered and ingrained within us that we are just pouring this out because it is the split-second step. It's not the gut reaction of an angry response. Or a deserving response? Or how can I assert myself in this type of situation? The next one is a singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord. Now notice that's internal. That's resonating with God on a level that is full of peace. It's not just harmony with your brothers and sisters. It's harmony with your Lord. They're all part and parcel of the same. The, it's not that you would experience one of these things or a couple of these things. It's the fact that you experience all these things because the main part of it is the fact that you are filled with the Spirit. 
How about this? Always giving thanks. Boy, this is one we're working on at home. Good gravy. Having a grateful attitude. Anybody ever had your kids be ungrateful about something? Especially when they're like eight months old. I'm just kidding. <laughs> How ungrateful you are. We made that milk for you. Just kidding. But now you're like, oh, good grief. This is a problem. They don't seem thankful. And isn't it interesting that in a world apart from God, you shouldn't be thankful. Why? Because you deserve everything. And it's your rights and it's the way that you want it. Have it your way. Just do it. Thanks a lot, mainline advertisers. We appreciate that. Thank you for fueling my ego so I can love me more. And I don't understand why I love me more, because I'm so unlovable. You ever notice that? We really know how unlovable we are, but yet we love ourselves more than anybody else. Maybe that says something. I don't know. Always giving thanks. That's an outflow of the Spirit. And also this one. This is the one that people have probably the most problem with. Is being subject to one another. What does this mean? These are all expressions of the Spirit's filling. So this is God's heavenly goal for the church. When we got to the beginning of chapter 4, we looked at God's earthly goal for the church, which was the idea of having pastors, teachers, evangelists pour into the church, equipping them for the work of the ministry so that they would begin building themselves up and be a glorifying spectacle, honestly, a workmanship, God's poetry in eternity. That's his earthly goal is for that to be happening now. Here's his heavenly goal for the church. And be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church. He himself being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless so husbands ought to also ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies he who loves his own wife loves himself for no one ever hated his own flesh but nourishes and cherishes it just as christ also does the church because we are members of his body for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh this mystery is great, but I'm speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Nevertheless, each individual among you also is to love his own wife even as himself, and the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. Now, the majority of that's what we're going to be looking at in the ensuing weeks. But the big part I want us to see is the idea of mutual subjection in the assembly. And notice the first part we have in verse 21 is the idea, be subject. Now watch this, because not only is be subject, the idea of the last thing that's mentioned in flowing from the main verb of being filled with the Holy Spirit, but it's also what sets up the understanding of the examples that are given after that in the rest of this section, because it's all focused in on subjection. So if we need to know what anything is, we need to know what it is to be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. What does it mean? This is the Greek word hupotasso. And it's the idea here of submission in a sense of voluntary yielding in love. This means to be subject or to submit oneself or to subordinate one's self. In chapter 521, the imperative is a voluntary choice. He's, he's encouraging us that because you would be seek to be filled with the Spirit, that you would voluntarily, out of love, bring yourself under one another in the body. Now look around. Notice it doesn't say, subject yourself to the pastor. Notice it doesn't say, subject yourself to the elders, or the deacons, or the staff. It doesn't say any of that stuff. It says, subject yourself to one another. The person that is most important in this room right now is not me. I 
I'm leaving. <laughs> when you go back and edit this, just cut, cut all that out. The most important ro- person in this room is not us. It's others. And this is the call. And recognize this. It is the Spirit-filled person who has the perspective that others rather than self. Let me give you an example of how practical and real this is. Some of you came here today with the idea of, I'm looking to learn something. I'm looking to grow. I'm looking for something for my kids. And a lot of it really centered in on the idea of me. Now, I don't want to fault that because I do think the intentions and all that are good. So please understand and hear me out on this. But if the idea is, is what if every believer came to church looking for an opportunity to encourage or pour into another person? To take the time to maybe step back from asserting self and actually throw these on and throw these on and listen and look this person in the eye and actually spend the time caring for somebody else. I know, in somebody's heart, they're like, well, that's what we hired you for. It's not. And to think that is to recognize that you don't know the Word of God. My job is to equip you and to encourage you in the direction that God would have you to go. My job is not to satisfy your need. My job is to tell you where God wants you. And so in doing that, the perspective of even how we walk through the doors into this building, we might actually find that there's a little bit more of self tagging along than maybe what we thought was there. It's the idea of everybody else but me. It's the idea that other people's concerns, cares, problems, situations are needing of the salve of the Word of God over them more than my own do. And here's the amazing thing that you find out how the Holy Spirit works is when we take that approach in community with one another as the body of Christ, you find that you actually grew and you were actually edified and you were actually ministered to in the process, but it wasn't by you getting, it was by you giving. That's the paradox of God. Remember, for Him, up is down. It's not self. It's others. It's never self. It's always others. So with that being said, depending on the context, this can also be seen as an involuntary manner. In fact, I didn't harp on this much when we looked at it in chapter 1, but just to refresh you a little bit. In the prayer that he gives, he's talking about Christ, what happened in his resurrection. It says, and he, being God, put all things in subjection. All of that right there is the word, hupotasso. Put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And so in other words, why is it that Jesus is king? Well, number one, part and parcel of his person. But number two, what it really shows is the involuntary followership that's been assembled under him why because he's been made the head of all things therefore everything has to fall in under him and this is why when we read a passage like in every knee will bow either on the earth or in heaven or under the earth saved or unsaved it doesn't matter why because all subjection will come underneath him eventually we're just waiting for the time to transpire for that moment to come But he is the king. And all subjection is due to him. He is the one of which we are answerable to. So what does it mean? This is really good from Weiss Word Studies. Again, if you don't have Weiss Word Studies, get it. Download eSword on your phone. Download eSword on your tablet, whatever. You can get it for free as a download. It's really, really helpful. It's a great tool. The prefixed preposition hupo means under. The simple verb tasso was used in classical Greek in a military meaning, to draw up in order of battle, to form, to array, to marshal, both troops or ships. It speaks of soldiers marshaled in military order under a commanding officer. It's the idea of who's leading the charge? I want to fall in line voluntarily underneath that and allow them to lead the way. Let me remind you of this quote. Every believer likes to advance himself spiritually. 
but hardly anyone likes to exchange himself for another man why because let's be honest when there's cupcakes on the table you want to be in the front of the line yeah because if i don't get there and get one they might be gone Well, maybe the person who was having trouble getting their debit card to work over at Walmart because of one reason or another needed that cupcake more than we did. We never thought about that because it wasn't about others. I was too busy asserting me. That's the difference. That's the difference. How do we deal with the idea of not only to be subject, to bring ourselves willingly underneath this idea, to fall in line under, but the fact is, it's other people. You don't know hardship until you worked with other people. Yes? Some of you work with other people for a living. It's fun. It's tricky. It requires sensitivity. It really requires a quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. But good grief, our entire life has been set up for others i just wonder sometimes if we're catching up to that reality it really is and a lot of times we can't see the joys that pour out of that and we definitely don't benefit from the riches that pour forth from it because we are the dam in the way of blessing one of the greatest things that god could ever do in our lives is tear us to the ground i know that's hard to hear but it's true. One of the greatest things that he could ever do is get me out of the way. You guys know Alex who comes from Ethnos? You know him? I love that guy. They're not able to be here today because somebody rented the van and took it away and he had no transportation for students. Remain flexible, right? I'll never forget what he said one time. He looked at me and goes, you ready to get out of the way today? I didn't realize how in the way I was until he said that to me. I've never forgot that. Are you ready to get out of the way today? And let's be honest, if I had to open up here and look at my heart, I would see, no. Ultimately, I'm really not. Well, in relation to one another, we have to be. Let's see this unfolded. If you would, take your Bible. Turn with me to the right a little bit to Philippians. Just one book over. We're going to look at chapter 2. And this is famous for the word kenosis. The kenosis. I'm going to show you what that is. But this is Paul instructing Philippi. Philippi was a good church. They had some great things going on. Had a little bit of friction from some ladies going on there, but that's okay. He was really addressing them with the heart of love. It's encouraging. It's uplifting. But he still recognizes that the tendency towards self is just sometimes insatiable. So he's redirecting them, recorrecting them, and helping them to see things in a new light. And in chapter 2, we're going to start in verse 3. Look what he says. Do nothing. <laughs> Do nothing. Now, I don't know about you, but that is like a cut and dry statement. What is it? Nothing. Okay. I don't want to do that. Here it is. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit. Why didn't he just say conceit? That ever blow your mind? Why do you have to clarify that for me? Because all conceit is empty. We just don't realize it. Do nothing. Not one thing from selfishness or empty conceit. There it is. If we didn't memorize any other verse in Scripture to live our Christian lives and just knew half of this one, we'd be doing pretty okay. Nothing. Uh-oh, here comes a problem. Well, here's the first thing you know, Jeremy. Self isn't welcome. Whew, got that one out of the way. Well, he's coming back. Be careful, you know. But, and notice where it starts. With humility of what? thinking take off the old man cast it aside renew the mind and then put on the new man it's not just give me that shirt that's what you do with kids when they get kool-aid on themselves 
But it's that teaching time in between that has to take place before you put on that brand new shirt. With humility of mind, regard one another. Be subject to who? One another. As more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests. That's not a bad thing. You should. Why? You got stuff that needs to happen in your life too. I get that. Paul's not asking you to live incredibly abnormally to the point to where you are battering yourself. It's not asceticism. Okay? It's not this, well, unless I have lashes inflicted upon me, I'm not really living for Jesus. No. Don't, don't ever think that. It's not the idea of the fact that you've become so destitute. It's not that. Take care of yourself, but look what it says. But also for the interest of others. The problem is we do the first part of that verse ridiculously over and above and beyond what we should. And we often don't even think about the second part of that verse ever. It's all about other people. And if we thought more about other people, we would have less problems dealing with everything we're trying to accumulate for self. The person who dies with the most toys doesn't win. They die. Notice it says in verse 5, have this attitude. Oh gosh, it's not just a problem with the mind. It's an attitude problem. Now I don't know about you, but that feels like it's somebody just put a steel pole right up my spine. Get your attitude correct. <gasps> Have this attitude in you, this thinking, this way of dealing with life and presenting yourself in relation to other people, which was also in who? Stop. Without the Holy Spirit, that's a tall order. With the Holy Spirit, it's completely reasonable because it's totally accessible. See, that's the beauty of salvation in our lives. It unlocked the door to the warehouse of the grace of God and said, come in and live it. And it's like, yeah. So when I see something like this, oh, well, I could never do that. You're right. You can't. Christ in you can. And Christ in you will. If we could just get out of the way. So notice what it says. Have this attitude in you, in yourselves, which is also in Christ, who although he existed in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. In other words, though Jesus had full ability to exercise his God rights in every situation, he decided to withhold asserting all of that all of the time. It was a voluntary choice to do it differently. We'll see why here in just a second. He says here, he did not regard equality with God, a thing to be grasped, but here it is, kenosis. He emptied himself. That's what it means. Kenosis means to empty. It'd be the idea of, of taking a bucket of something full of water, nasty water, something like that, pouring it out, and then like, here's a kenosis. Here's what it looks like. Hollowed out. He decided to hollow himself out taking on the form of a servant. Pause for a second. The king, of which there is no other king that will ever be in comparison with him whatsoever, decided to take on the lowliest position that there possibly was on the face of the earth. Why? Because he emptied himself. See, that's the problem here. Is what we're actually talking about is what we all need is a spiritual catharsis to take place. It's a situation where if I'm so full of self, there's no room for God to work. So why am I expecting anything different? What needs to happen? Somebody needs to pull my plug and drain me out. Why? Because the Holy Spirit will not fill a person if there's no room to be filled. Filling cannot happen when the glass is already full. So notice it says, he emptied himself, taking on the form of a bond servant. And being made in the likeness of men, having a human body just like us, being found in appearance as man, he humbled himself. Does everybody see the correlation between emptying self and humbled self? Emptying self, humbled self. Does everybody see that this is a voluntary act? In other words, we have to take the initiative. You have to at least be open to the idea of God tearing you down. 
Let me speak to that because it's pretty serious language. I don't know what you think of when you think of that. Maybe a wrecking ball taking out a building. But if you really want to know some of the most incredible riches of what Christ can do in a life, it is the idea where you've offered yourself up to Him as the living sacrifice that we should be. And you find your heart not desiring anything else but what He wants for you. You don't really know what it's like to live abundantly until you experience that moment. Because you're not worried about your future plans and you're not worried about your 401k and you're not worried about how you're going to make it through this next family reunion that's coming up. You're not worried about all these other trivial things of life. You're finding that you don't have to because you've recognized a key truth. God's got it. And He's always had it. He's just waiting for you to catch up. He's waiting for me to get over myself. I've told some of you this. I actually have a post-it note in my office sitting on my computer monitor that says, you are not the arrogant exception to the rule that you think you are. You know why? Because I need to know that. Because I will easily try to exercise that right. I will pull that ace out of my pocket and play it if I have to in favor of self. And that's reckless. Because all I'm doing is feeding sin. Have you ever come to that point of humility and an emptying where you've recognized that if your life is ever going to be anything of any worth of any time, it's going to be because you gave way of it and let Christ have His way in it. That's spiritual growth. That's exchanging the old man for the new. Notice he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. You know what that tells me? It tells me that Jesus, if given the option, would have died on the cross before he ever would have sinned to serve himself. None of us have ever come to the point where we say, you know what, I would rather die than sin. In fact, we're so quick to sin to make sure that nothing harmful ever happens to us. We live such hallmark lives. Good grief. Somebody needs to set our, our field of dandelions on fire and make us recognize that if we're not living for the life to come, we're not living. And the life to come can only be lived because of Christ living in us. And this is where it requires us, especially in relationship to one another, to hupatasso, to voluntarily come underneath another and consider them better than ourselves because we've emptied ourselves and we've humbled ourselves to make room for them. Notice not only are we to be subject to one another, but it also it must be done in the proper way in the fear of Christ. It gives that at the end for a reason. Sometimes we do many selfless acts because we love the selfish accolades. We love the kickback. Right? A bellhop never takes the luggage up to the room because they're not expecting anything. The reason why they carry all your junk is because they want something from you. How different is it to do something and reject any notoriety at all? Some of the best quotes I've ever read are anonymous. Might be a reason for that. Maybe this is why Hebrews is such a stellar book. Nobody knows who wrote it. Holy Spirit wrote it. That's all we need to know. Maybe that's what makes it amazing. Here's a question. Who's our head? Or who's the head of Christ? Forgive me. The Father is. We know that. In fact, you were able to answer pretty quickly. Okay? Cheeseburger for you. That's good. Look at Jesus' words here. Living His earthly life. Playing it out for everybody to see, recorded four different perspectives in, this, in the Scriptures. Watch this. Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of Him who sent me and to accomplish His work. It's not. My food needs to be hot and ready and now. He doesn't say that, does He? He definitely doesn't say, I'm going to order my food here and get my food here and eat it right over there. He doesn't do that either. He says the thing that sustains me and keeps me going and fills me up 
is to do whatever God has sent me to do and to accomplish what he gave me to do. Life's mission is now all about, I just want what God wants. How about this one? I've come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Now that sounds kind of odd. You're like, wait a second, isn't Jesus God? Yes, he very much is. One in essence, three in persons. Jesus had two natures, 100% each one, 100% God, 100% man. And that 100% man nature was able to be tempted, yet he never sinned. And that was the pull that he felt. Jesus understands this struggle between doing what I want to do and considering others better than ourselves, yet because he's God, he never succumbed to it. Because we often go with ourselves, he ended up having to die for it. How about this? John 5, 19. Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of Himself unless it's something that He sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, these things the Son also does in like manner. If it's not something God wants, I'm not doing it. Can you imagine that place in your life? I only want what God wants, and if God doesn't want it, I don't want it. Because I know the inside, you're like, but you really want it. And I'm like, I know I do, leave me alone. And you're having to come to terms with that struggle between flesh and spirit, flesh and spirit. How do you deal with that? You hupotasso. You voluntarily line up underneath God. You make the choice because you're reflective upon the love that he had for you to get underneath him even though you don't understand a clue of what he's doing. How about this idea? I can do nothing on my own initiative. As I hear, I judge. That's pretty serious. And my judgment is just because I do not seek my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Every judgment that Jesus ever made or will ever make is always going to be in a perfect alignment and a grand representation of exactly what the Father wants. This is the life that is lived to teach us how to hupotasso. If you you labeled all the Gospels, the first hupotasso of Jesus, the second hupotasso of Jesus, the third hupotasso of Jesus, and the fourth but slightly odder than the other three hupotasso of Jesus. If you know the Gospels, you know what I'm talking about. But if you did that, you would do nothing desecrating the meaning of what that is because that's really what it comes down to. He came, and he came in God's will, and he came to give his life as a ransom for people, and he laid it down willingly. Others, others, others he's setting the model for what the body of christ should look like it's not like he doesn't know what happens after his resurrection he planned it he set it up he knew israel would reject him he knew that he needed an entity to come in and be a light to the nations he knew that the gospel needed to have an entity to play out in and that is the church you know if we would do away with most of the seminars today on leadership and do a few on followership we wouldn't need any on leadership I love this man. He's discipled me more than anything I can think of. If we would just learn what it is to follow in the church, leadership wouldn't be a problem. We all want to lead. That's the problem. Who's our head? Who is the our head? Kentucky education, guys. And he, God, put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him Jesus as head over all things to the church. God gave Jesus to us. Why? To be the head to lead us. Because he knows we can't lead ourselves. Notice, we are his body. We're the fullness of him. We're the fullness of him who fills all in all. You say, what does fill all in all mean? It means we are the completion of everything he desires to do on the earth because we are the manifestation of him when he lives his life through us. So, Here's some guidelines on submission to think about. Just a couple things. Actually, six things. Forgive me. The spirit-filled believer is the submissive believer. Well, I don't know if I'm spirit-filled or not. Well, there's some qualities there to look at, but the question is, is are you submissive? They go hand in hand. And if all I'm doing is seeking to submit to what the Lord wants, I will find myself being able to easily submit to one another within the body of Christ. The next one, the new man does not care about my rights. He doesn't. He cares about others in light of God's opinion, in the fear of Christ, in the fear of Christ. It's not about, well, this is what I want. Great. You know, take that out back and fertilize the lawn with it. It doesn't matter here. It doesn't. Why is that? Because it's about Jesus. It's not about you. And it's not about me. 
And that's why if the door on the refrigerator wants to swing this way or this way, it doesn't matter and it's no reason to stop and create a brand new denomination over it. How dumb Christians have been over time. Recognizing that they have sacrificed the unity and the display of Jesus Christ for people to see so that people would come in and be saved all because I don't like how the refrigerator door swings on a refrigerator I don't even own. Raise your hand if you've heard people dividing from a church over silly issues like that. Good grief, it's like a rash. That's so dumb. Why? Because that's the way I wanted it. Cool. If you donated it, you donated it. Get your hands off of it. It's not yours anymore. And if you didn't do it for the Lord, then take it back. We don't need it. But those types of things are not given for the purpose of manipulation of my rights. That is godless. Don't do that. The next one, study Jesus. Study his life. Got four gospels. You're not going to run out of material. Study all about how he interacted with people. He shows submission to the Father perfectly. In fact, his ability to not be threatened and all the situations that surround him were directly related to the fact that his submission to the Father was unwavering. He dealt with that first, and all this didn't matter. Why? Because it all fell in place because the main thing was the main thing. It's beautiful how that works. The last one here. Spirit-led submission is always characterized by humility. I sure am glad I could come here and bake all these cookies for you guys today. Well, good job. There's your reward. Move on. Isn't that what Jesus says? Don't be like the Pharisees. Or, oh, I haven't eaten in days, but it's because I'm holy to the Lord and fasting. No, you're not. You're a whiner and a complainer. Shut up. Good grief. It's legalism. That's legalism. Look how holy I am. Everybody, pay attention. Look at me. Look at me. Look to Christ. What am I possibly going to give you that Christ can't give you abundantly more? Stop looking at each other and look to Christ. Look to Christ and we can look to each other submissively. Let's get on the other end of this, especially for what we're going to deal with next week with wives. I'll tell you this. I'm having to pray a lot about my anger about next week's sermon. I'll just go ahead and tell you. That's a real deal. Because I'm so tired of how these barbaric men who walk around in wife beaters have treated their wives over the years, saying that it's a Christian principle that they submit. I have no tolerance for oppressors or abusers in the home. None. That is hell-laden attitude. And any time that you've got an abusive husband like that, or somebody who's going to have that type of attitude, or scream and yell and cuss at their wife and cut them down like that, God have mercy on your soul. So that's what I'm praying about. Pray for me. Spirit-led submission never involves sin. Well, honey, you're supposed to submit to me because you're the wife. Isn't that what the Bible says? No, the Bible says you're a tool and I'm not going to submit to you. That's what it says. Any submission that involves sin is actually abuse. Recognize this. If it involves sin, it's abuse. It's abuse. That is not a word we should throw around lightly. But if you want to use the idea of exercising submission, and it's usually not that you're seeking to exercise submission under somebody, it's that you're trying to force somebody else to submit when maybe they're not at that point with the Lord. Something between them and the Lord. Recognize this. My job is to encourage you in the direction we ought to go. It's between you and the Lord if you're getting there. But here's the thing. If we're saying, well, you ought to do this, you really should be doing this, or you're not really saved, or if you were really a good wife, you would do this, stop all that nonsense. They're a good wife because they put up with your crap. That's the reason why. Any submission that involves sin is actually abuse. Recognize this. It's abuse. God is not pleased. God hates oppressors. Read the Old Testament. He hates it. The last one here. Any questionable submission should be held against the Word of God. If you're not sure and you're thinking about, hmm, I don't know about this, great. Go to the Word of God. That's what it's there for. It is an unchangeable standard of which to check every situation and to come to a Holy Spirit wrought conclusion. Jesus would never abuse His body. Abuse in the church has no place. 
This is a humble coming under. It's not a, hey, finally, I get to assert my rights because these other people are going to get under this. No, no. As soon as that person is looking to assert their rights, that is no longer hupotasso. That is legalism, period. And you are not in the spirit in those situations. So that's why we needed to take one Sunday just to dwell on what does this word mean? How do we see it modeled? How does our thinking need to change about this? Because this word, and in fact, if you notice, look at verse 22 real quick in your Bibles if you can. Ephesians 5, 22. Notice that it says wives and then you've got be subject in italics. You see that? That's because it's not in the text. That's because the idea is a carryover from 21 pouring into the rest of this to see how it happens. And regardless of what you husbands think, verse 25 tells you how you are to submit. You are held accountable to submit as well. So this whole thinking about only the wives submit and the husbands kind of get to rule and do whatever and, you know, their, their scepter is the remote. Calm down. It's not where it's at. We have such a warped view of family. We have such a warped view of marriages and what Christian marriages look like. That cannot sustain. It is not God-pleasing. And it needs to be come to terms with, rooted out, confessed, and dealt with. Period. There needs to be repentance that takes place. So, but that's next week. Let's pray. God, how I thank you for the ability to do something we could never do apart from you. And that is to be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Is to bring ourselves underneath your headship in a full and total way to recognize God we're not going to do it perfectly that's why there's grace there but there's also grace that desires to lead us in this better way of recognizing that others matter people matter to you that's the whole reason why we have the mission statement we have we are here to love people to life in Christ you died for people you created people you love people and because you love people We need to love them as well. Help us, Lord, to recognize where we need to empty ourselves and where we need to humble ourselves and where we need to unassert ourselves and where we need correction. And Lord, help us to deal with the correction that you give to us well. Help us to handle it in stride. Lord, if we're recognizing now through the work of the Holy Spirit on our hearts, areas where we have just been all about me, I pray, God, that we would come to sound confession to you now. That this would be a beginning step of humility in a new way, in the way of the Spirit, in the way that Christ is set forward. And may He live His life beautifully through each and every one of us here so that we can so build up one another every day. We pray that in Christ's name. Amen.